Hello. Sorry, sorry about that. Already messed that up. Um, my name is Chris Viles, and um, I'm going to be moderating this panel. And uh, the panel is entitled The Language of the Good, Fighting Fascism and Culture. And we have three distinguished panelists here, and I'm going to just be very brief um, in introducing all of us. So my name is Chris Viles. I am a professor of history, sorry, professor of English and American Studies at um, the University of Connecticut. Um, also to my um, uh, you know, immediate uh, left, um, Philip Eliasoff, who's professor of art history and visual culture at Fairfield Inter University, um, author of much, but also he wanted to um, emphasize that there's an Arthur Schick um, exhibit at uh, Fairfield University that's open till um, December 16th, which looks fabulous. Um, in the middle, we have um, Samantha Baskin, who is a distinguished professor of art history at Cleveland State University, and is also um, the author of five books, most recently, The Warsaw Ghetto and American Art and Culture. Um, Last but certainly not least, we have Thomas Doherty, who is professor of American Studies at Brandeis University, um, author, a major scholar in film studies, and uh, most recently, um, he is also the author of, um, oops, sorry, I just got the, uh, the, the uh, Hollywood, or not most recently, but he's author of Hol Hollywood and Hitler, 1933 to 1939. Now, I was just going to say a few comments to kind of frame the panel here, which is on, first of all, all three of our panelists are about to show you images from comic books, graphic illustrations, um, from magazines, and clips of narrative film. But in such cultural artifacts might seem trivial when thinking about a fight against fascism, especially when that fight, historically, has involved legislative campaigns, legal actions like the SL. SPLC has been waging, and of course more visceral fights like anti-fascist street fighting, physical resistance to coup d'etats, not to mention epic hot war against fascism known as World War II. But the importance of culture, be it a DC comic or a prize-winning novel, is that it helps to activate the ideas, beliefs, and values of these more visceral battles and campaigns, and to enlist people in them in the first place. In the 1930s, from inside one of Mussolini's jails, Italian leftist political philosopher Antonio Gramsci wrote that politics are incubated in the terrain of culture. That is to say, for an idea to even get to the realm of formal mainstream politics, much less to animate a physical battle, that it has to begin in the everyday wor world of uh, words and images where values and beliefs are circulated and forged. Now, this was well known to artists, writers, and filmmakers in the 1930s and 40s who created anti-fascist work. Whereas Germany, Italy, and Japan moved to the right in the Depression years, the United States in many ways moved to the left, and a vast, um, fundamentally anti-fascist movement pushed for a more equitable economy at home and a more aggressive foreign policy against fascist aggression abroad. They pushed FDR and Congress um, to adopt foundational economic reforms in the period and helped to create a legal infrastructure for workers' rights and a social safety net in this country that remains to this day bruised but still breathing. As our panelists will il illustrate, Jewish Americans were critical to the movement of the 1930s and 40s, especially its cultural wing, where they were overrepresented. Over Jews intimately knew the stakes of the fight against fascism as it was aimed at their very existence. Um, so their work enlisted those both inside and outside the Jewish community in the fight against fascism, and it's important to remember in this context that before the United States entered World War II in December 1941, fascism was not universally understood to be a dirty word in the United States. Its value was still in the realm of debate, and it had to be made into a dirty word in the realm of culture. Jewish American cultural and political work before and during the war helped to make it so. So I have kind of three questions or some, a set of questions for y'all, but to spend probably the most time in the first, um, I want you to, just each of you, you brought in various artifacts, right, various cultural artifacts. And if you could just walk us through um, the artifacts you're gonna be kind of um, discussing and also a little bit about the artists and authors um, and basically how they represented fascism to American audiences and how their medium shaped their message, so. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me take a moment to uh, acknowledge the outstanding relevancy of today's panel. I know it's been said before this, this morning, but I remember Gab Rosenfeld 
talking to us about this uh, almost a year ago uh, as, it, as this was being developed. And it is, as you know, Yogi Berra once said, it's all deja vu all over again. And in a way, sadly and almost tragically, that we are talking about these issues of danger, anti-Semitism, threats to the Jewish people. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that clearly. Uh, I've had the privilege of working on an extraordinary artist, and though the theme is America, in the case of author Schick, who was born in Łódź, Poland, can we? Let's put up the first uh, image of author Schick. I'd like. And Schick is, of course, in generations of American Jews, know his great uh, Haggadah, his great work, he grew up with uh, various editions of the Schick Haggadah, but he was uh, an immigrant who had arrived in the port of New York City. He arrived in the fall, uh, November of 1940. And so what we have with Schick is a unique character who straddles, who straddles. He was totally aware of the threat of what Nazism was. He was completely aware of uh, the mortal danger uh, of it as Paul who was living in London in the 30s. He comes with the help of the um, British and Canadian embassy. He arrives in, in uh, Halifax, and then he uh, comes to, to New York City. Uh, reportedly, this was where, this is anecdotal. Uh, the newspaper in Halifax reported he arrived in 1940, and the New York pr and the press was talking about he had a price on his head. He was already a dangerous man as a political cartoonist and illustrator. When, you, when we look at Schick in, in his life journey, he is, think of somebody who is coming from the Eastern Ashkenazi Pale of Settlement, or, or from po he's from Poland. He's a kind of Roman Vishniak meets Norman Rockwell. And he's an extraordinary uh, bridge between uh, the understanding the threat of Nazism, understanding fascism, uh, understanding living in London in the late 30s, seeing what Kristallnacht and what was happening, and at the same time, he made his way to America to become this extraordinary propagandist. He was uh, known best as the uh, soldier in art. Okay? Uh, and this is an extraordinary drawing on the upper left. Uh, our the great scholar and the person we would not really be speaking about Arthur Schick in this context or our exhibit, which is on loan from the Magnus uh, Jewish uh, Library up at, at Berkeley, uh, were it not for our great friend uh, Irv Ungar, who really has devoted his life. And Irv is here. I want to acknowledge him and with all my heartfelt appreciation for uh, Irv has has. It, has spent, thank you Irv, Irv has spent the last 35 years, 40, 35 years of his life completely resurrecting the career of this extraordinary artist. This drawing is dated 1933, and it's so, con, uh, it threads so beautifully back to the way he, Hitler is being portrayed here as Pharaoh. And in doing so, the whole 3,000 year history of the Jewish narrative of the fight against tyranny, the fight against uh, dictators. In one drawing, we already begin to see Schick at his powers, and this is 1933. So we understand that what he will do is showing us the threat to America. In 1940, this illustration appeared in the American Mercury magazine, and I wanted to give a, a shout out to my friend Gab Rosenfeld, my colleague for, uh, from Fairfield University, and this idea that the Statue of Liberty is being transformed into this grotesque image of the face of Hitler. And if you look very carefully at the lower left, you see a figure of Charles Lindbergh, America first, leader, decorated. And on the right, playing with a toy airplane, is Hermann Goering. And we all know how Lindbergh, Lindy, the great American, this irresistibly iconic, handsome, swashbuckling fellow, he so dominated the American, uh, American, America First movement at that time. So I use this as a kind of 
This is the prelude, I'll say everybody. This is the prelude and we'll move on, okay? Thank you and I wanted to just thank the Milbergs, Ellen and Leonard for their sponsorship today and for their friendship as well. I'm interested, oh good, they're up. I, I am interested in comic books and caricature as well, like Schick's work, and cartoonists and how they, these different figures combat fascism. So we're starting with Superman because he's Superman. And Superman was the first com superhero. He was, he was conceived in, 19, he first came to light in Action Comics, 1938. And he was conceived by two Jewish teenagers from Cleveland, Ohio. So Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, I think it's important. They're Jewish and it's important that comic, the comic book industry was built by the, by the Jews from the ground up. So even the founders of early comics, um, Charles Gaines, he kind of invented the comic book. There were funnies in the newspaper, but then there were, you know, he got, came with, up with the idea, let's staple them together, make them into books and sell them. So Superman. It's imp the dates on all these covers, and I'm showing you covers on purpose because covers are really how fascism was first explored. It, what, these stories didn't make it into the comic books until quite a bit later. So here we have 1941 Superman cover, and on the other side we have 42. Look at 42, it's a little bit more aggressive. So here we have Superman, he's got, you know, holding Hitler and Toho, up, you know, like he, like Superman somehow can make this better. Superman can conquer fascism. And remember, comic books are fantasies. And these are just fantasies. Um, what's interesting is how, so, so if, if Siegel and Schuster invent the first superhero, what, go, what happens from there? Well, Superman's so popular that there's lots more superheroes that start popping up. The advance, great. And I think these two images are particularly important for the fight against fascism. The image on the left is world's finest comics. It's Superman as well as Batman and Robin. And look at the cover. This is patriotic. This is, oh, and um, Batman and Robin were invented by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, both Jewish. Um, Robert Kahn was his birth name. And here we have them, the, the true heroes, the message here on this cover, the true heroes are the American soldiers who go out and fight. We have the heavily muscled arm and we have, you know, that's embracing these important Americans who are going out to fight. So that's one kind of message that we have on these covers. Again, the stories inside are really not, they're not about Hitler, they're not about fascism, but these covers are so bright, so this is about the medium, it's technicolor. The covers are so bright, they're on the newsstand and people see them, they may not buy them, but they see these, these sort of sound bite messages right in their face, you can't miss these. Now also they were really popular and people bought them a lot too. And importantly, the, in the military abroad, they all traded these, this, the most, the mail that went abroad the most in the mid 40s were comic books and the GIs traded them and they talked about them. And then this um, sensation comics, I mean it's hard, there weren't a lot of female superheroes back then, but Wonder Woman was a superhero invented by a man not Jewish. So this is the first not Jewish comic book maker. Um, and oh, his name's Charles Moulton. He was actually a psychologist brought in to talk about like what comics are doing. And he had his own, you can look him up. <laughs> but in Sensation Comics, here we have Wonder Woman. And look at her in her patriotic outfit and she's protecting the Capitol. And I love that it's a woman and that she's empowered. Um, the, the Charles Moulton, his, he, didn't, he was asked to write a comic. He didn't know what to do. He said to his wife, what should I do? And she said, as long as it's a woman, do whatever you want. <laughs> and so here we have Wonder Woman, this is, she had, just, um, she had just been in an earlier comic, this is the first time she's on a cover, and she's protecting America in her quintessential American outfit, and this actually is, this derives from Captain America, who we will look at in a moment. Great, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Chris, and thanks to the Center for the invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful symposium. Uh, I'm really honored, and especially this week. Uh, I do Hollywood. 
And uh, I thought I might uh, show a clip really quickly uh, because when I teach undergraduate students, you always like to tantalize them with a clip before you give the lecture. I probably won't have to set it up for this audience as much as I do for my undergraduates because judging by the hair color or lack of care, uh, in the audience, uh, some of you are probably familiar with Spencer Tracy and Mickey, Mickey Rooney. Uh, in the uh, panel earlier today, uh, Steve Ross referred to Hollywood as the world's most effective propaganda machine. Uh, now, we call it propaganda if we don't like it. If we like it, we say it uh, promulgates positive cultural values. And uh, I think Hollywood did promulgate a lot of positive cultural values between 1933 and 1945. Now, in terms of the relationship between uh, Hollywood and Nazism and anti-Semitism, I think there are three distinct timelines uh, that we might keep in line, uh, mind. Uh, 1933 to 1939 uh, marks one chapter, right? And, that of, uh, and then 39, when war erupts in Europe, and 41, when America enters the war, marks another distinct chapter, uh, because Hollywood, for the first time now, is producing avowedly anti-Nazi movies. Uh, from 41 to 45, uh, which is the time frame you guys were involved in, uh, in Hollywood terms, the films actually, in some ways, to me, become less interesting because they're explicitly anti-Nazi and they can engage with Nazism in an explicit level. But before then, it's almost always allegorical. And in 1939 to 1941, of course, if Hollywood is making an anti-Nazi movie, they're ahead of the curve. America has not yet uh, entered the war. So I want to show you how Hollywood would do it in a typical year and move back a little bit in time to 1938, which I really think in some way is the pivotal year for so much American popular culture and its relationship with Nazism. I always get, uh, 38, of course, is the year where you have the Anschluss uh, that spring, uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia uh, you know, after the Munich Pact on September 30th, and then Kristallnacht. And I always get the impression that after the you know, uh, Americas are going through the Great Depression. Who really cares about what the Germans are doing in Europe? Uh, we have other problems, but 38 is the year. I always think of, you know, dad at the breakfast nook looking over to his wife when he's reading the newspaper at some point in 1938, and, he, and he's saying the Germans are back at it again. You know, like, finally this is the year that it's, it's back on the radar. And Hollywood begins responding allegorically. And this is my absolute favorite allegorical response to Nazism. It's, uh, it's from a uh, 1938 film called Boys Town. Has anybody ever seen it? All right. Uh, uh, directed by Norman uh, uh, Torog. And this is the moment where Mickey Rooney, who's the tough kid who's going into Father Flanagan's orphanage town, uh, and he doesn't want any part of this reform, uh, is introduced to the ethos of Boys Town. <laughs> Hello, Your Honor. Finished your tour? The bell saved you, didn't it, buddy? Buddy, you're sitting beside me. All right, half pipe. Thank you, O Lord, for these like gifts which we have received from the most Father, I thank you for this food. Gracious God, may the food which we are about to receive strengthen our bodies. What's the matter? Can't you all learn the same words? You don't have to. You say the kind of grace you want to say. At Voice Town, everybody worships as they please. Think the way they want to think. Sure, some of us don't have to go to chapel. If you're a Catholic or a Protestant, you can go right on being nothing. Well, I'm nothing. Then you can go right on being nothing, and nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This is, this is American persuasive propaganda at its absolute best, isn't it? Where it doesn't, like, really shove it to you in the face the way totalitarian propaganda does, but it does it in a really emotional, uh, very uh, a congenial uh, sort of way. Now, every time, I'll say just one more thing, uh, if I might. Uh, every time I see that clip, I want the kid to say Catholic, Protestant, or Jew. We're not quite there yet.
but you've got to be a real dumb spectator in 1938 <laughs> not to realize that this is a ecumenical moment where we're embracing people from all different uh, religions. Uh, and he is, and it's especially important is that it's a, 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 an explicitly Roman Catholic environment. Because of course, besides Father Flanagan, the most famous priest in America in the 1930s is the anti-Semitic radio priest, uh, Father Coughlin. You also have the deep background of the Spanish Inquisition with forced conversion. In Boys Town, everybody gets to worship the way he wants to. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. So um, my first round of questions is for all of y'all, and it's basically about the effectiveness or efficacy of your various artists and your various artifacts. So um, you, and you could address the question of effectiveness in a sev several ways. One, one way to think about it is when I ask how was, was their work effective in getting across an anti-fascist message, one way is to think about it is did the did the um, artifact itself, did the comic, did the, the illustration of the film actually convey something about fascism that was core to it, that was a transportable lesson about fascism that was useful? Second thing to think about, too, in efficacy is how um, widespread um, did they get their message across? How vast was their audience? Um, how were they positioned within the culture industries to make a difference? So, Sure. Okay, let's pop up. I think we have a, uh, let's go to that, uh, no, let's, let's go next, forward, 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 no, no, go to the, here, let's do that, let's do that. Effectiveness. Uh, let's imagine a time when nobody has cell phones, nobody has televisions, no one has anything, no one has cable uh, news on a 24-hour cycle. Um, the American public is going to be informed about issues through popular culture, and this is a very important intersection of popular culture and the gravity of global politics. But popular culture becomes then the, the most effective tool, and as we move from the complete uh, isolationism, uh, Gallup poll, first week of September, 1939, 84% of the American public, non-intervention in the European wars. We saw this in Ken Burns' series, America and the Holocaust. America was not going to be lured. The America First movement, America First movement had the largest uh, membership of any, of any movement in America in the late 30s. Um, we know, that, as we said, the Nazi party was in 1939 held there. Washington Day rally just at Madison Square, a few blocks from here. So the idea of authorship using the cover of Collier's Magazine. Now here is this immigrant, he arrives in New York and quickly, within the first few months, he's the art directors of the major magazines realize his extraordinary communicative powers this cover on the left, I want you to, it's called Madness. If you look carefully in the lower right, the, it, Schick signs it September 1941. Very carefully, look in the, up, in the right, lower right corner. He is shouting to the world that Hitler's ambitions are not just going to be as the veil has dropped over France, Belgium, England is now under the blitz. He is saying that be prepared, America, for global domination. He's, he's like Paul Revere shouting out to the, to the boys at Lexington Concord. Madness. And that is extraordinary, this image of how Schick is projecting. And I'd like to point out the, some of the differences of Schick in comparison of the other American uh, great illustrators, cover artists, Norman Rockwell, J.C. Leyendecker, uh, there are m important paintings of the war done from the Office of War Information by Thomas Hart ben Benton, for example. But let's face it, Schick has his mother and his brother back in Poland, in Łódź. And in a sense, he's the only major communicator to the American audience using a, a magazine that has a 
circulation of three million people, and then think about once it's passed along the barber shop and the hair salon, millions of people are going to see what the threat is. This was drawn, this was painted just before Pearl Harbor, and it was published on January 17, 1942. He had proven, the, he had augured and proven the prophecy. Note the, the uh, other artists who are Gentile artists, uh, Rockwell, uh, 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 Whitmack, Leyendecker, their response to the war is more anecdotal. Uh, the GI, the, the home, the sentimentality, Schick has to go full force in making his point, in making it as powerfully as possible about what fascism is going to be. Samantha? All right, will you, I think my slides are right before this set. All right, great. <clears throat> so I think Captain America is a really interesting, um, particular. this cover is particularly interesting. Probably most of you have seen it in some reproduction somewhere before. The f so Captain America is specifically invented to fight the Nazis. Superman just did because they, they were there at that point, but that wasn't his specific focus. Captain America, Steve Rogers, who was this sickly, kind of, just kind of scrawny guy, he wanted to be a soldier, and he took a super serum so he could be a soldier. This is kind of, in, this is, you know, Captain America, also is you know, um, created by two Jews. In particular, Jack Kirby is the artist who becomes the greatest comic book artist of all time, in not just my opinion. And in this case, you know, Hitler's getting a sock to the jaw. It's got that Marvel feel to it. This is Marvel Comics. Um, it was earlier called Timely. And in this case, so we have a superhero made specifically to fight Nazis, to fight the Red Skull. We have this energetic cover Inside, there is some fighting with the Red Skull, but um, over here, this is where things get really aggressive. So this is a new Batman. Batman's, this is 1943. If you notice, March 1941, America's not even in the war yet. But here, Batman and Robin are, the efficacy here, I think, I think what really makes it, it's not about patriotism anymore which we saw in the earlier comics with World's Finest. Here it's about fear. And I think the idea is if you instill fear in these younger people, maybe they'll want to go to war. You instill fear in the larger community, maybe they're gonna realize how serious this war is. And in this case, the story inside is about, is about fascism. So it's not just a cover to catch your eye. Inside, it's swastika over the White House. And of course, it's a comic book, so it is a little bit campy still, but it's serious stuff. A German infiltrates the White House, and he's gonna take it over for Hitler. And eventually, Batman and Robin thwart the plan by essentially crushing the plan with a large swastika. So yes, it's fantastical, but it's scary, and the cover is scary, and it's not a bright Technicolor cover anymore. It's real, the comic book landscape is starting to really change, and it's effective. This is most definitely effective. As I said before, these comic books are in the hands of so many young people and so many old people and so many across the ocean and so many um, at home. Uh, yeah, Chris, yes, Chris asked the question about efficacy, and I think one of the ways we know that films uh, and their messages were so effective is that everybody argues about them. Uh, you always go to the public screen representation to kind of argue about race, class, ideology, uh, or whatever. Uh, and maybe the best example of this is the Production Code Administration, which comes in in 1934 to systematically regulate Hollywood cinema. And one of the ways that Hollywood is negotiating Nazism is, is that it, it has to uh, uh, deal with three constraints throughout the 1930s. Uh, one is the production code, which actually forbids Hollywood uh, from treating the nation of any country on the planet disrespectfully. So it basically means you can't make any criticism of anybody. Uh, the other constraint is the, uh, the foreign market. The German market is still kind of influence, influential, and Hollywood uh, doesn't want to affect the distribution of films in Nazi Germany. Two of the studios get out immediately in 1933 
when the, uh, uh, the Nazi government says you've got to fire your Jews in your distribution branches in Germany. So Warner Brothers and Universal get out, uh, MGM, Par Paramount, and Fox stay there basically to the bitter end. There's a lot of debate about why. My own sense is it wasn't the money because they're not making that much money. But in the 30s, everybody thinks Hitler's going to get a bullet put in his head at some point, and they want to sort of keep the distribution pipeline and everything in place in case the, the, the Germans go back to their senses. Uh, and then the third uh, reason is the ethos of classical Hollywood cinema. Uh, through most of its uh, uh, life, but especially in the 1930s, is that we're an entertainment machine. People don't come to the movies to uh, see geopolitics debated on screen. They come to see Ginger and Fred dance in Art Deco apartments, and uh, who wants to be disturbed with all these uh, frightening headlines in the, in the newspapers? Uh, but when Hollywood did address anything controversial, there's a lot of dialogue about it, and everybody knew these images were important. And then one, one quick anecdote, one of the reasons I love to speak to groups on Hollywood cinema is everybody has their own set of eyes, everybody has an expertise or memory that I do not have. If I were teaching biochemistry or tax law, that might not be true, but all of you know Hollywood very well. So I show that uh, a clip from Boys Town. A woman comes up to me, is that a JCC or something, about 10 years ago, elderly woman, very polite, says, I love that film. It's one of my favorite films. And I say, yeah, it's just a marvelous uh, piece of work. And she says, you know, the first time I saw that film was in Budapest in 1939. And she said, when I saw it in Budapest, they cut out the Jewish kid with the yarmulke. So the fascist Hungarian government knew that was an important message that they did not want their citizens to see. And then she said to me, to, which is why I tell this anecdote and I think I can take it to the bank, she said the reason I know that there was a Jewish kid in the original print was that a friend of ours did the Hungarian subtitling for the English language prints that were released in Hungary. And he said when the print came in, it had the Jewish kid but they cut it for the theatrical release. So these, these films, everybody knew they had a pro profound effect, which is why you, you cut things out of the movies. You didn't, you didn't want the Hungarian audience to see this in 1939, where a Jewish kid is accepted and welcomed at the table in a Roman Catholic environment and is a totally equal member of the community of Boys Town. Thank you very much. And so also before I ask the last question, just to be mindful too, if you have questions for our panel, um, someone will be coming around uh, momentarily to take your questions down um, and they'll give them to me. And if, also if you're watching online, um, the, uh, you can write your questions in the chat function. Those will be printed out and given to me as well. So um, the last round of questions here uh, before we get to Q&A too involves the kind of the lessons for the present, right? And I think the... Uh, the un kind of unfortunate subtext of this conference and a lot of the scholarship and a lot of what we've written is that fascism it, it doesn't didn't die in 1945, right? That it does have an afterlife. That we basically we use these terms, you know, conservative and liberal all the time, or conservative all the time, knowing that, you know, conservatives now are not going to look exactly like, um, you know, Alexander Hamilton or Edmund Burke, right? Fascism has begun to have that same kind of afterlife as a as a descriptor of the present, right? And so I guess um, when fighting basically, you know, right, far-right extremism now, or what we term fascism now, what lessons do you find um, in these cultural productions that's kind of transportable to the present? Okay, let's take a look at uh, another great work by Arthur Schick. Let's go to the next one. And the next one. And that's all we got, okay. All right. Uh, the wor I think that in the case of Arthur Schick, being an art historian, being an art critic, we're talking about really the universality of the visual iconography, and that when whether these are events in uh, caricaturism in ancient Rome or uh, the caricaturism of Hieronymus Bosch to uh, Hogarth lampooning the British aristocracy, to Daumier making mincemeat of the, uh, the, the Napoleonic uh, uh, successors, whether it's Thomas Nast 
whether it's authorship to David Levine, to R. Crumb, to Art Spiegelman, you're going to have to have devastating images that are going to be in the tradition of the grotesque, and they're going to be offensive, and this is about the nature of fine art. Because the visual, the visual rhetoric of art, whether it's past, present, the contemporary issues of whether uh, the images of, uh, you know, I, I think about uh, after 9-11 when there was this spate of Islamophobia, for example, and there were very, you know, the images of the enemy, of the Islamic en enemy. Um, I feel very strongly that um, as, as Jews, as the Israelis, American Jews, will understand that the dehumanization of the enemy is something that is going to be understood, and yet, on the other hand, whether you're asking 15 million American boys from farms in Kansas and Minnesota to go to the beaches of Normandy or to the jungles of Iwo Jima, you're going to have to create something that is going to make the enemy look very, very wicked and evil. And there's, to be you know, perfectly frank, you cannot woke, you cannot PC when you're at war. And we are talking about a time when there was an enemy, and as Churchill and Roosevelt understood, it was total victory. It wasn't going to be that we're going to treat whether the, our German or our Italian or our Japanese enemy with a kind of great humanity and respect. This was the enemy, and they needed to be eliminated. And so this equivocation of, well, f sometimes I'm asked by my students, oh, Phil, oh, Dr. E, um, you know, the Jews were stereotyped in the De Sturmer magazine, and Jews were being caricatured with all kinds of terrible, grotesque faces and images as we see in the Holocaust museums. How could an artist like Arthur Schick use the same tools? Well, I think that it's quite different when you are the victim and when you're trying to end a genocide which will murder six million European Jews. So whether it's past or the enemies of the present, and in this case, our Israeli uh, family and friends are fighting against an evil force, what the President of the United States, President Biden, called sheer evil. So everybody in the audience, let's think about how do you want to caricaturize sheer evil? Will you pull up my slides for me? Yep. Thanks. Because this, this, this is what I want, perfect. I think that these two images um, really help show what Phil's talking about. Um, world's Finest Comics on the left. Here we have Batman, Robin, <clears throat> and Superman. It's baseball season, by the way, here. It's this spring issue. And they're knocking, you know, they're knocking out the axis with bonds and stamps. Well, for one, comics are being used to get money for war, to raise money for war, for bonds and stamps. But at the same time, if you can see, there's caricature going on here, as well as the image on your right as well. So look at how, I mean, Hitler, okay, we can caricature him. We're not caricaturing, caricaturing an entire people. But in general, Japanese people were caricature, caricatured in a really <clears throat> standardized, kind of ugly way for, for the moment now. In fact, there's a comic, so um, I should mention, I'm looking at comic books, but Dr. Zeus was a major comic artist at this time doing caricatures, Saul Steinberg, Al Hirschfeld, you know, major classic artist. Dr. Zeus was not Jewish, the other two were. But then if you look at the image on your right, here we have, you know, more bonds and stamps and more caricatures of the faces. There's a pretty harsh, um, drawing by Dr. Seuss, he, he made lots of images for PM, as did the other artists that I was mentioning, as did Arthur Gick, in which um, one French figure says to a doctor, okay, I'm going into the Japanese army, I need slanty eyes now, like he can get them at it, it's terrible. <clears throat> I've got comic book covers, which are to fight against the Japan Nazis, and those are the covers of Superman and Batman, like these characters that are supposed to be wholesome and American, but every bit of the arsenal was pulled out 
at this time in comics. And then one other thing I wanted to say, because when Ruth was talking this morning in the first panel about Trump and propaganda and cultism, what came to my mind, and I always carry books around even when I'm traveling out of state, was one particular comic I want to just tell you about briefly. And, <clears throat> hold on, here we go. So it's Hitler, and he's got a baton, and he's got a baton over a man's head, and he says, this is an Aryan. He's composed of A, uniform, B, body, C, propaganda, formerly called soul. That's by Saul Steinberg in February of 1943. So the, the past does inform the present. Go ahead. Just before Tom speaks, just as a reminder that um, the person's coming around to collect your questions. So. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, your, your question, uh, I guess when you mentioned that a lot of conservatives today uh, don't look like uh, Alexander Hamilton and Edmund Burke, I, I feel compelled in the last week especially to point out that a lot of people who call themselves progressives uh, don't look like Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt today. So when you see fascism, wherever you see it, uh, the solution is probably to stand up to it. And I happen to have a clip from uh, the 1938 episode of a very influential screen magazine called The March of Time, which I think some of you might know about. Uh, it's best known today as the, uh, the model for the News on the March sequence from Citizen Kane. And a lot of uh, my students don't get the joke because they weren't watching The March of Time in 1941. And if audiences had come into Citizen Kane five minutes late, uh, they, which they didn't back in the 1940s, uh, they probably wouldn't have known that this was a satire. They would have uh, read it as the, uh, uh, the March of Time. And in uh, January of 1938, the March of Time got a cameraman into Germany, Nazi Germany, and did a, the first full-length expose of what life was like behind the scenes of Nazi Germany. Uh, now, of course, it had to be compromised. Goebbels watched the cameraman, but the guy got you know, a couple shots of the benches, and especially the narration was avowedly and explicitly anti-Nazi. It was probably the first time most Americans saw the images on screen that now on spool in our heads incessantly, the images of the, you know, the, the marching not Nazi Superman, the, the swastikas, the German leaders, uh, because these things, even when they were shown in the newsreels, might have been cut out by the local exhibitor. And it concerns uh, a confrontation with the German-American Bund, which of course was the fifth column uh, run by the Nazis in America in the 1930s, uh, from uh, Phil's neck of the woods in Connecticut, where uh, the town is having a typical good old American New England town meeting in which they're discussing whether they should let the Nazis uh, buy some property in their county to uh, have a campground. So this is the clip from- And last call for questions. teaching film for 30 years, no matter what the technology, it always, you know, it's a projector, the bulb blows, VHS, the tape gets eaten. Yeah. In New York City, loudest mouthpiece in this Nazi propaganda drive is the national chairman of the Hitler-inspired German-American Bund. He is Fritz Kuhn, former German machine gunner, now a naturalized American citizen, who claims to have enrolled 200,000 U.S. Germans under the swastika. At his meetings, Führer Kuhn preaches orthodox fascist doctrine. diesen Lügen und Verleumdungen, die die Presse tagtäglich in den Tageszeitungen bringt, Widerstand leisten kann. 
Across the United States, Vera Kuhn has established 25 summer camps and drill grounds where those German-Americans who believe in Nazi teachings can imitate Hitler's mighty military machine. At New York meetings designed to promote friendship and end the U.S. boycotts on German goods, uniformed Nazis parade. Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! Their mere appearance doubles the picket line. When Vera Kuhn, with plans drawn for a New England Nazi encampment, purchases a site in Connecticut, he meets unexpected opposition in a community long proud of its tolerance. We have no quarrel with what we term the older order of German people. But we do object, and we do protest, against the insidious, treacherous activities of Nazi agents masquerading as American citizens. Mr. Chairman, two of my great-great-grandfathers and four of my great-grandfathers fought for liberty. So did the other people of this town. I call upon all of you here to keep the Nazis out. But the most... There are a, a lot of exhibitor reports from that time that said that uh, audiences applauded in tune with the audience in, in, in the film for the woman. So uh, it uh, really was, I think, <laughs> Chris, can, can I just, uh, let me go, Tom, I think one of the most effective uh, visual icon iconographic emblems of what and why we are in the war, which this really captures, encapsulates, and it comes out of Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech, uh, and what the good citizens of Southbury, Connecticut was saying there is that this is not relevant to what America is about, and that was caramelized into Roosevelt's State of the Union speech and I'd like to mention that it was author Schick who actually did a series, they were poster stamps called the Four Freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom, freedom of fear, freedom of religion, freedom of want, and it was, we all know the Norman Rockwell images that are up at the museum in Stockbridge, but those themes were, I think, what corralled and galvanized the American public that Racial, religious intolerance was why, as the Frank Capra in his films, why we fight. All right, so we got some great questions here. And I think the first one is uh, really for um, Samantha and Philip, um, both, I think. So one of the questions was, we heard that the hallmarks of fascism are propaganda, violence, and the scapegoating of an enemy. And the uh, comic books and, you could say, Arthur Schick's work as well use some of those same elements, you know, or at least a kind of a um, clear kind of mission-oriented propaganda, you know, violence, scapegoating an enemy. Um, and so what is that, par the question is, what does that paradox imply about how we motivate publics in a time of crisis? Well, I think that how we motivate times, how the public in times of crisis is different than all of this that we're seeing because we have social media now. We have, a com we have such you know, different ways to communicate. And in fact, what I find interesting is how older artists currently use social media who used to use different kinds of media. For example, I've been watching Yoko Ono um, recently using social media, whereas she used so, much, so many other different kinds of media in her past. Um, but I don't know what this current moment's gonna look like at all, and I'm scared. The little bit of propaganda that I've seen, I've seen it you know, in ways that are so offensive to me, but would be not be offensive to somebody else, and it's ubiquitous, and it's out of control. You know, it's the snowballing, whereas this, this there, was a, there was a measuredness because of the, how it could be you know, laid out, how it could be trans, you know, transmitted. I don't know what's happening next. But you usually know. Oh, well, let's let's go to the core of the question about the uh, the 
the question assumes that the word propaganda, propaganda in and of itself, is something negative and pejorative. Uh, propaganda is at the very root of all visual communication of Western art. Uh, if some of you remember sitting in with a Kodak slide projector, remember that? And you looked at the battle standard of Ur, when you looked at the Assyrian palace reliefs, when you looked at the Trajan's column in Rome, when you looked at the Arch of Titus, all, when you look at the effectiveness, the word propaganda, the, or which was founded by the Holy See in 1622 in Rome, the office of the propaganda fide for the propagation of the faith, the Catholic Reformation. So Arthur Schick says eloquently and succinctly, all art is propaganda. So let's not think of him being a propagandist in any way, in a negative light. He was using the visual art to arouse the sympathy for the good fight and for the good cause. Thank you. And this one, I believe, is for um, Tom. Um, and uh, the question is, can you speak to film after 1945, right? And to elaborate on that, um, uh, you know, how does the fight against fascism in film kind of shift after we're not in a wartime context anymore? And uh, the questioner has raised as prompts to immediate post-war films of gentlemen ag Gentlemen's Agreement and It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, a great question. Uh, what, what happens is really interesting. From 41 to 45, of course, uh, Phil mentioned uh, Frank Capra's Why We Fight, and there are a whole slew of documentaries and Hollywood feature films which promulgate of American values in a very, uh, I think, emotional, didactic way. Uh, you know, perfect Hollywood ability to communicate that tolerance and teamwork is important. Uh, you know, reaching back to our deepest roots to reestablish, uh, you know, what freedom and patriotism is. But of course, we're we're beaming these messages out. Uh, when our army is segregated and when uh, there's still a lot of anti-Semitism at home. But we don't want to talk about that during the Second World War, and I think it's really understandable that you want to emphasize unity and not disunity, not the problems we have at home. After 1945, it's like all those wonderful messages we beamed out come bouncing back. And now we can actually start talking about them. And uh, there are, you know, th that great wave of Hollywood social problem films uh, that start coming out in 1945. Maybe the first Jewish-related landmark is when Frank Sinatra, in a wonderful short called The House I Live In, uh, which some of you probably know, uh, gives a lesson, in, a musical lesson in tolerance uh, to a group of street kids who have just beaten up a kid because he's Jewish. And then there are the two uh, films that you, or I think you just mentioned one of them, which was Gentleman's Agreement. And the one that comes out uh, before is a film called Crossfire. And I think between them, these films, address the issue of anti-Semitism explicitly, which we hadn't done before. Uh, by then, America's ready to hear that message, and the, uh, Hollywood gives you these messages usually in two ways. One is the way I hate, which is uh, somebody looks into the camera and gives us all a lecture because he really knows what Americanism and tolerance is, and you know he's got to lecture us because we're stupid. Uh, and then there's the better way to do it. So in Crossfire, there's actually a lecture about, you know, you shouldn't kill Jews. Uh, but the, 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 the more ecumenical way to do it is uh, there's a scene in which Robert Ryan, who is the vile anti-Semite, is uh, 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 standing next to Robert Mitchum, who is the embodiment of post-war masculine cool, right? And Ryan touches him on the uniform, you know, on the shoulder familiarly. And Mitchum looks at his shoulder like, oh, now I'm going to have to get my uniform dry cleaned. And I don't care about Jews one way or the other, you know, the average moviegoer might be thinking. But if anti-Semitism repulses Robert Mitchum, I do not want to be an anti-Semite. So, so all these, uh, these films that come out, and of course there's another wave in 4950, which touches on the real touchy issue, which is Jim Crow. So uh, all of this stuff comes out of the Second World War. Uh, direct result of all that wonderful propagandizing people like Frank Capra did, and now we can start uh, addressing, you know, some of these films look a little corny or compromised in retrospect, but they were very important at the time. Thank you. So uh, another question that's kind of um, expanding on this a little bit too is about, the question is specifically on Hollywood today, but right, if you want to expand it out to all of y'all, um, 
you know, what is some equivalent of kind of, can you think of some Jewish American culture work, cultural work that's more contemporary, right? That's doing some of the similar kind of anti-fascist cultural work, or at least that's trying to revive the idea of a clear and present danger on the far right, e either at home or abroad. Some kind of more contemporary examples um, that kind of um, do a, a, some similar cultural work. Well, the, the genre that I work with, comic books, has evolved in many ways. So the graphic novel is a, you know, everybody loves graphic novels now. It's the marriage of text and image. It's a really exciting medium. And so within, within that medium, we have different kinds of conversations because these books are longer and they do take on more serious subjects. They're not necessarily technicolor. They use different techniques. We can have splash pages and, you know, and different, or different panels. They can be black and white. And not taking on fascism so much, but, and of course, you can't talk about comics, I don't think, without mentioning Art Spiegelman. He shows the effects of what fascism did. So if any of you haven't read Mouse, it came out in the 90s in two different, 92, 96, he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. It's a really important book about his father, Vladek's journey as a survivor, you know, everything that happened to him based on interviews and I think it's really valuable. There are a lot of graphic novels that function that way. So Joe Kubert's Yussel is another example. He was a comic book artist originally during the Silver Age. I know we're running out of time, but there's a great arsenal of books and graphic novels out there for you to read about fascism and the effects of it. Just want to jump in that I had a recent conversation with Art Spiegelman, and we were talking about the production of Mouse, and he said, you know it was from Schick's drawings and cartoons that I learned the details of the Nazi regalia. That, that he, he used it as almost his source book. Maybe just quickly, one motion picture or net HBO drama, right? Nobody goes to movies anymore. Uh, that I might recommend and might put some of all, all of this together with the Lindbergh is uh, the uh, David Simon HBO series uh, based on Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, right? which uh, I think clearly was made not about the 1940s, but about uh, uh, the present uh, uh, time period that, that we're in. Uh, did, it really tanked in the ratings. I think people maybe weren't ready for it, but it might be worth a, a, a second look. And I think you guys know the, pl the plot against America. It has a, a conceit that's really terrifying because it's so plausible. Most of these uh, kind of counterfactual novelistic conceits like one of the Confederacy, one the Civil War, or whatever, you kind of have to leap through several uh, hoops of imagination. But the conceit here is that if, what if Lindbergh had run for president in 1940 on an isolationist platform and won? And that's actually not an implausible a conceit in 1940, given the stature of Lindbergh. I think today the bloom has gone off the Lindbergh legend, but certainly in 1940 would remember that gallant kid who flew across the Atlantic in 1927. Uh, and as your statistics uh, uh, mentioned, uh, Americans did not want any part of another European war. I think the, the reason uh, the plot against America as a, as a film series was not really uh, a, a success is uh, there was an exhibit in 1996 at the Jewish Museum, Norman Kleeblatt curated it, and the title of it was I think very pertinent. The title of the exhibit was, it was, the title was Too Jewish. And within the Jewish community, there is an understanding, a almost telepathic understanding of these, the undercurrent of these themes for the rest of America, red state, blue state America, it might be a little, a little too allegorical or metaphorical. All right, well, with that, we're um, at time. So thank you for everyone for uh, spending your Sunday afternoon here. And also thank you for Gabrielle Rosenfeld. Um,